It was the era of high nationalism, of high homogenization of culture within states. But with the advent of information technologies, the monopoly of the state on information, on commerce, on uh, warfare has been fundamentally undermined. And there's no putting that cat back in the bag. Natalie, welcome to the show. Hi, great to be here. So Natalie, I've seen some of your work and I thought you have some definitely some interesting things to say about Bitcoin, anthropology and uh, political economy. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background as an anthropologist and then sort of how, how you're thinking to mesh these worlds of Bitcoin and anthropology? Sure, yeah. So... I'm, you know, I trained as an anthropologist in uh, the early 2010s, um, historical anthropology, um, also, you know, did quite a bit of work in, um, in philosophy, and, uh, you know, then kind of made a transition into industry. So, um, you know, I've, I've been in a number of roles uh, as a brand planner and um, as a technology sales uh, executive, uh, co-founded a company in 2016 um, that built the first Bitcoin-based digital identity wallet. Um, so, you know, we recognized pretty early on that um, an immutable ledger for verifying transactions can also be an immutable ledger for verifying digital claims, um, which, you know, is increasingly important as we move into an era of disinformation, misinformation, AI generated, um, just explosion of data, the need to verify the provenance of that. Um, but it's also quite important to do that um, in a self-sovereign manner, meaning in a manner that um, privileges the, um, the individual as the source and authority of, of uh, information about themselves. So that's kind of my background. Um, I've, you know, my company was acquired in 2020. Um, I, I still lead business development there. Um, and I also co-founded the Texas Bitcoin Foundation, which is a 501c3 public charity specializing in research and education about Bitcoin and political economy. Great. And so... Yeah, I think there's a lot of implications and things we can get into uh, around what kind of impact Bitcoin will have on society. Uh, and I think another interesting area is uh, this, I guess, debate between, uh, let's say, some anthropologists and some economists on uh, where money formed and you know what is the real origin of money. I know you're writing a paper on this that's in draft. So do you want to just tell us a little bit about this and how you got this idea to, to write about this? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, my my anthropological training um, focused on uh, a set of literatures that tend to not take uh, economists and economics into account, um, or if they do, they they treat it in a very polemical fashion, and and this often comes down to just ideological disagreements um, between. Uh, many anthropologists um, and many economists about um, the the value of capitalism as a form of political economy. And so a lot of anthropologists sort of treat the entire discipline of economics as an extended apologia for capitalism um, and and feel this this need to discount and disparage it as a result. Um, of course, as, as you know, I'm sure economics is not all one thing. There are many different schools uh, of economics. Um, a lot of what um, gets branded as economics is, in fact, some flavor of neoclassical economics or Keynesian economics. Um, and there are, you know, of course, many uh, different uh, interpretations and schools of thought uh, around, you know, everything from uh, money to credit to uh, entrepreneurship to you know the the role of uh, middlemen um, in an economy 
to, you know, most fundamentally this question of value, which both anthropologists and economists um, deal with. It's it's sort of the master concept of both fields. And, and so what I perceived coming at this from an anthropological standpoint is that the discipline was not actually making use of some valuable insights from the discipline of economics, valuable, ha, huh, um, that could in fact inform uh, anthropological investigations of value. And so that's, that's the direction that I'm going. And in this paper, which, um, I'm authoring for the Satoshi papers, this is the first, um, uh, edited volume of, of peer reviewed essays on Bitcoin, um, that uh, I believe has been published ever. Um, so the, the focus of my paper here is just to address David Graeber's theory of money. So Graeber is an anthropologist. He's also a very effective popularizer of anthropological concepts. I have a lot of respect for Graeber. Um, this is why I take him seriously enough to, to offer a extended rebuttal, I think, to his theory of money, which, um, you know, is, is kind of in this place of you know, when a lot of people talk about anthropological theories of money, they're, they're really implicitly talking about Graeber's theories of money, um, because he is one of the few anthropologists who have elaborated systematically a theory of money. Um, and so I, I wanted to kind of address his work specifically as an entryway into this broader question of value and bringing the disciplines of, of anthropology and economics together. Right, and I notice in your paper, or at least a draft, that uh, there's this clash. And I, 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 funnily enough, I remember seeing that clash on Twitter. Uh, yeah, and right. so David Graeber in that clash is arguing with Nick Zabo, who's also a legend in the Bitcoin world, obviously, right. for his work. Um, and also, it gave me these tones of... On one, on one camp, you sort of had the Austrian economists who were arguing this commodity money theory, right? Karl Menger, origins of money in the 1870s, talking about how money evolves. It's this theory of like a bottom-up thesis, whereas uh, there are different theories of money, of course. There's this top-down charterlist or state theory of money. Um, and so, I, and as I'm understanding, David Graeber's view is more like, oh no, it started as debt and it's credit, and that's really what it is. And then on the other hand, you sort of have the Austrians and others, Austrians and related other people who are arguing, no, no, actually, it's a commodity money theory. Um, that's how money at least started. Is that, would you say that's kind of a, a high level summary, or how would you add to that? Yeah, you know, there are these two broad schools um, in monetary theory that that are interdisciplinary. So uh, economists, social scientists, anthropologists, um, you know, there's the charterless school and the metalist school or the commodity school, and they have different theories about how money originates and what it is. Um, you, you offered a, a pretty effective summary there. You know, the charterless view is that money is a creature of law. Um, and law is the, the provenance of the state. Um, so it, in effect, um, whatever the state decrees to be legal tender within its jurisdiction becomes money. Um, there, there are, are commodity theorists of, of money who argue by contrast that money is the most saleable good. And so it emerges bottom up. Um, from countless interactions of, you know, market actors trying to transact and not being able to transact directly, which is, you know, barter, good for good. Um, and so they need an indirect um, mode of transacting. Um, money becomes this, this literally medium of exchange because it's the thing that most people in that market are likely to want. Um, so if you can't sell you know, good A or good B or good C, um, you probably can sell money. Um, and so, you know, these are two different points of view. Um, my proposition in this paper is that it's not an either or. Um, there, there are, in fact, examples of charterless money, uh, state-declared legal tender 
fiat currencies. I mean, these things exist. They are, they are out there. They're material phenomena in the world. They're used as media of exchange, but they're not a universal monetary technology. And so what I'm, what I'm arguing is that money is a social technology. Um, but like any technology, it can be sort of tailored to different use cases. Um, so credit money is, um, very useful under conditions of, of high trust, you know? Um, and when we, when we say credit, all we mean is deferred payment. Um, so, you know, transacting on credit is, is as old as time itself. Um, and, and in this regard, um, I agree with Graeber. I think he's, he's saying something true. Um, but not all forms of transacting are, um, high trust to that extent. Um, there, there are entire categories of transactions that, um, are either with strangers or with enemies, um, or, you know, with, with people you may not just have an established relationship with, you, you encounter them only peripherally. And so you don't really trust them. Um, and you need to transact with them. So what do you use under those conditions? Well, you use something that has use value in and of itself. Um, and commodities, uh, are that. So they're a category of good that's useful. Um, and then when they are used as money, they also attract a monetary use value. So, so what economists call a monetary premium. Um, and these, these currencies, these forms of money are used again, low trust or with people you don't trust very much, but also under conditions of very high risk transactions. So the, the stereotypical example in anthropology is, is the wedding. Um, a marriage is an institution. It's a, it's a social institution. It's extremely fraught. Um, the entire community has an interest in making sure that the marriage endures and succeeds and produces offspring and, um, you know, generates value and wealth that is then passed down as inheritance in the community. And so the families that are coming together in a marriage and then the wider community in which those families are situated, um, they have a lot on the line in this working out. Um, and so in effect, a marriage is a contract that needs to be heavily collateralized, um, with items of real value where, you know, you're, you're putting real things at stake. And so, you know, whether we talk about dowry systems or bride price systems, very often those are denominated in commodity monies, um, to a large extent. Um, because there has to be, there have to be teeth <laughs> to, to this contract, so to speak. Um, so two, yeah. two types of money. It, yeah. And in a sense, I guess people are showing that they've had to make a certain amount of sacrifice, right? Like if I'm going right. to give you my daughter, you need to pay X amount of gold and this number of cows and, you know, et cetera. I, right. At least historically, that's what it might have, you know, happened. And maybe today still in parts of India or something, you know, that kind of thing might still happen. Um, but so I, I am curious on, I think you might have seen some of the debates that have gone back and forth. Um, between some of the, let's say, commodity money theorists, the so Austrians and other people, and uh, people like uh, the late David Graeber. Um, I think one area that's interesting is if we're going to think of it uh, as, okay, it's just, you know, it's just this ledger or it's this credit system, what's the credit system denominated in, right? Because mm -hmm. we could ask the question, well, you know, even in some of these examples where David Graeber talks about Mesopotamia or something like this, you could ask the question, well, hang on, how did they know to use silver, right? Like right. they had to, you know, was there a process of market discovery and then, you know, the state in that system had to sort of piggyback off that and say, okay, we're going to now take control of this institution and turn it to our purposes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and this is again, where we, we get into different types of money as different social technologies. So, um, both credit money and commodity money at the end of the day are redeemable in some value. There's always, even with credit money, 
the IOU eventually has to become something of real value. Um, and in fiat currency systems, what that is, is GDP. Um, so instead, it, so the difference between credit money and commodity money is that a commodity money, the, the IOU at the end of the day, at the end of the chain of IOUs, um, is redeemable in a fixed amount of a concrete commodity. Um, so that's why it's, it's much, it's considered much more stable, um, f from a lot of people's point of view, because they know that, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's redeemable in silver in this much silver. This IOU is redeemable in this much silver. This IOU is redeemable in this much gold, um, or this much Bitcoin. Um, whereas with, fiat money, at the end of the day, what backs it is the economic power of the state as a whole, of, of the jurisdiction over which the state has sovereignty, uh, ostensibly. Um, so I'm just curious there, you mean, I guess you're, you're implying like the taxation revenue, right? Like the, in, in that context, it's like the state is sort of asserting its power over its citizens and residents and taxpayers, and it's saying, based on your future revenues, we're going to tax some of that and pay that back to our debt holders, which is the government bond holders in this case, right? Right. And, and it doesn't even have to be taxation revenue. It's the full assets of the state. Um, and so in, in situations of like dire economic extremity, like f for instance, the, the Weimar Republic, um, or, um, the Bolshevik revolution, um, where, you know, both of these, uh, both of these polities were seeing hyperinflation around the same time historically they both said you know forget tax revenues we, we don't have tax revenues um our gdp is or our um fiat is backed by the productive economic power of the people of this country but but how do you denominate that i mean how how do you determine that X amount of currency translates into X amount of units of GDP. Um, and it, you can't. And, and this is why, you know, uh, for like international lending, um, state to state, often the foreign nation creditor will just seize productive assets like ports or factories or land because, you know, the country they've lent to, the debtor country, can't pay them back in money. Um, so they go in and seize productive assets. Um, this is, you know, uh, what China is doing worldwide, um, as, as many countries default on, on their debt. Um, so, so this is the problem with fiat currency is that, or with, with credit money in general, is that it works as long as you trust that the debtor can pay it back. The moment you don't trust the creditor to pay it back, then the question of measurement comes into play. Okay, well, you're a hundred billion dollars in the hole. How, what does a hundred billion dollars translate into in terms of concrete productive assets? And the debtor has to come up with that value. Um, whereas if it was a commodity money, they were a hundred billion dollars of debt in a commodity peg currency that would translate into a very clearly measurable amount of a specific commodity. Um, so that's really the main difference is like, where does the chain of IOUs end in a credit money system? At the end of the day, it's assets, um, or in a specifically in a fiat money system, because there are different types of credit money. Credit money can, of course, be, uh, be backed by a commodity. We're talking about fiat money where the, the credit money is backed by the productive capacity of the country that is issuing the fiat currency. Um, and this, uh, this works as long as the economy is productive. It continues to grow. Um, but the moment you have economic, uh, collapse or, or even downturn, the sovereign credit crisis begins um creditors begin to wonder like hmm, like is sri lanka able to pay back this debt um is is the united states in fact generating enough economic value 
to support this massive debt. Um, and at that point, they start asking for, for real things, either commodities or um, real estate or land or industry. Back to the show in a moment. This show is brought to you by CoinKite.com. So for those of you who are interested in self-custody of your Bitcoin, and if you're holding Bitcoin, you should be, CoinKite has been around since 2012. And nowadays, they're really focused on Bitcoin hardware and hardware security. When we are securing our coins, we need a device that can secure the private key and also help us with signing the transactions, i.e. spending that Bitcoin. And a great device to do that is the cold card by CoinKite.com. The cold card is a really reliable and secure device. The cold card Mark IV has two secure elements. It's got a range of features. The reliability is really great. In my experience, you can use the micro SD card to move things back and forth between the device and the computer, or you can directly plug it into the computer and use it easily with desktop software such as Sparrow Wallet or Spectre Desktop or Electrum. CoinKite also make a range of other accessories that you can use such as the Block Clock, the Block Clock Mini and the Block Clock Micro, as well as steel backup plates and other devices such as the Tap Signer or the Sats Card. You can get all of these devices, all of these devices over at coinkite.com and use the code Levera for a discount on your cold cards. The lead sponsor of this show is Swan Bitcoin. Over at swan.com, you can start learning about Bitcoin and buying Bitcoin. Now, many people take an initial lump sum purchase and then they set up an automated recurring savings plan or Bitcoin purchase plan. And so just every week or every month, they're buying a set amount of Bitcoin, whether that's $50, $100, however much they are able to save with Bitcoin. And this helps them deal with the volatility of Bitcoin because anybody who's been stacking for a longer period of time has seen their purchasing power rise dramatically. Now, over at Swan, there is easy, free, and automated withdrawals. As we say in Bitcoin, it's not your keys, not your coins, and Swan makes it easy for you to withdraw to your own coins. Now, Swan also has a service called Swan Private. So for those of you buying larger amounts of Bitcoin, let's say over $100,000, go to swanprivate.com. You get an individual personalized service with a concierge, somebody who you can call. You get support in terms of corporate retirement and trust accounts. And so that's a great service for those of you who are buying larger amounts of Bitcoin. Otherwise, if you're just getting started and want to stack Bitcoin, go to swan.com slash Levera to get started stacking Bitcoin. And now back to the show. Right. And so I guess that can also become a heated thing because maybe the people of that country, like let's say of Sri Lanka, might say, hey, we didn't... Yeah. We didn't want this, or this right. was, you know, this was by a corrupt government who were t- right. putting money in their own pockets. And now, right. you know, there's this kind of justice question of is right. it really right to kind of enforce this, uh, you know, uh, obligation? I, I mean, it's it's kind of a hard. There's not really a right answer, right? Um, but I, I think maybe that's a, that's a situation uh, where it's where it's a breakdown in trust. Yeah, exactly. And so. When we're talking about all of these aspects, it's important to also consider what is what are the four what are the purposes of money, right? Like people normally talk about the three, right? Like unit of account, store of value, medium of exchange. These are kind of the main three that most people would talk about. Is there a, another category? Uh, and the reason I'm asking this is if you look at some of Nick Zabo's work, which I'm which I know you have, he talks about collectibles, and so mm-hmm. maybe there's this proto money form this yeah. kind of collectibles and then you sort of have uh the other stages uh w- what's your view on those yeah so um so sabo's theory of commodity money is that um commodity monies always em- emerge um from stores of value so um proto money is a store of value um and and i think that's fairly uncontroversial um you know his 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 theory is that um one of the ways that humans um have evolved to store value is through our capacity to appreciate beauty um so it's our aesthetic enjoyment that we derive from things from adornment you know jewelry fine textiles um shiny metals 
Um, these, these are technologies of value that we have learned how to store um, and then to exchange for, you know, other, other necessities. Um, so every, every example of commodity money that emerges in the, in the anthropological record is um, tied to some collectible uh, or emerges from some collectible that is used as a store of value. Um, the, what's interesting is that in order to, to truly become money, like a medium of exchange and a unit of account, as well as just a store of value, um, the collectible over time has to be refined into, um, a high volume of, um, in effect, interchangeable, fungible units, um, that have a reliable, that serve as reliable measures of value. Um, so that is the unit of account and, and the medium of exchange. You know, if, if I have a beautiful gold necklace, um, that's a store of value, but, um, that doesn't, it doesn't, it has to be appraised and there's a cost to appraisal. Um, so this is as Savo's other, other point is that, um, we often underappreciate the role of accounting in um the historical development of um both money and and uh mercantile economic systems and and ultimately capitalism the question of measuring value is actually extraordinarily uh hairy and um measuring value itself is a costly process and so the more that we can reduce the costs of measuring value the more we can facilitate exchange and so that's what money does is it basically serves as a shorthand um, for measuring value that makes it much easier to transact. Right. And so m- maybe I guess the, the commodity money theorist might say, well, it starts as, you know, barter and then eventually it evolves. And over time, there are different goods competing, right? As we said, the most saleable commodity. And over time, historically, that's typically been gold and silver. And so that then forms the basis for the accounting system, I, I presume. And then that accounting system is, becomes like, oh, okay, if we're doing business, it's worth, you know, 200 ounces of gold or wh- whatever, how, how much that price is, that's, that's where the accounting aspect comes in. Um, another aspect you mentioned in your paper is this distinction between payment and settlement. So can right. you just elaborate a bit on that, on the payment versus settlement distinction? Yeah, so um, thank you for reminding me, because you, you had asked about um, the three characteristics of money as a store value, a unit of account, medium of exchange, and are there other, um, perhaps, characteristics of it? Um, yeah, these these three elements are kind of where um, the consensus of most economists has come to rest on. But um, if you if you look at the literature one of the other characteristics that is frequently mentioned by both um, anthropologists and economists is money as a method of payment. Um, And, you know, what is payment? Payment is the settlement of a debt, or it's it's the method by which a debt is settled. Um, But it doesn't necessarily have to uh, always result in settlement. Um, So, you know, and this... This psychological distinction is really important because when we talk about settlement, what we're talking about is satisfaction of the creditor. Like the term satisfaction is a psychological term. Um, the creditor has to feel that the debt is settled because if they don't, they're going to cause trouble. Um, there will be social unrest. The creditor is going to try to get what's owed them um, in some way. Um, and so human communities have a really high stake in ensuring that all debts are reliably settled within their jurisdiction, because otherwise there's potential for violence, social violence. Um, and this is why the, the governing authorities tend to step in and try to define legally what constitutes settlement of various debts. 
Um, so in, in criminal codes, it's, you know, as, as, as old as they are, any criminal code you look at historically has, you know, a list of crimes and then, um, the compensation that is due, um, the victim of the crime, um, or, um, if it's a victimless crime, sometimes the compensation that is due the community or the society. Um, and that then becomes a normative, uh, practice for settling debts, but there's still no guarantee that in any particular case, the creditor or the victim or the wronged party, the plaintiff will be satisfied with whatever the legal prescriptions for debt satisfaction are. Um, and so like, you know, to, to give an example, um, there was a, a shocking case, um, I believe in, in the 1980s of, um, uh, a mother who discovered that her child had been raped and murdered, um, by, uh, by this man who, who then she pressed charges against, was taken to court, was convicted. Um, and the mother appeared at the sentencing in court pulled a gun and shot him knowing that she was going to go to prison for this act. This was an illegal act. You know, the justice system had done its work. He was going to be given the prescribed uh, payment for his crime, but she as the creditor found that payment insufficient. Um, and she determined as a creditor that through violence, she was going to settle the score. Um, so, you know, this is where we get into vendetta, um, vengeance, the, the institutionalization of the blood feud, um, which is characteristic of many human societies across history, particularly stateless societies, when you don't have a court system to enforce the payment of debts. Um, you often get this chain of retribution, um, that becomes a vicious cycle and, and that that is extraordinarily destructive of life and property. Um, and so a lot of the reasons that we, uh, human societies evolve a state um, is because they're trying to tamp down the violence of um, either individual or small groups like families or clans um, engaging in this chain of retributive violence for a debt that can never be settled. Um, because the creditor can never be satisfied. Um, and that process, you know, we've, we've managed to achieve rule of law that, um, precludes the blood feud, but that system is always in danger of breaking down. And when does it break down? It breaks down when people lose trust in the institutions of justice to actually deliver uh, to reliably deliver, you know, more or less satisfactory set settlements of debt. If, if people start believing that the justice system is, uh, rigged or, um, unfair or is captured by interests that it is not going to serve them, then they begin to take matters into their own hands and creditors begin deciding outside of the law, um, much more frequently when they are satisfied. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess they, it, it can be like a vigilante context or maybe it can be a context where maybe people look for a extra legal, you know, judge even. Maybe maybe that could be something we start to see where people start to go outside of the, you know, the jurisdiction that they're in. They look for somebody outside to sort of um, rule what's the, what's the right... Um, course of action um it's interesting yeah. though with like with you know even with the blood feud yeah. aspect of it I, you know I, i'd have to be a bit skeptical that uh, we've solved that with the state i think uh many states have yeah. uh have in fact exacerbated that with you know if you look at the war on terror and how there are mm -hmm. all these people who you know then they cause all this blowback and this is a point that people like ron paul has been making for, you know for decades right um so you know, I guess it's unclear to me whether that we've had a net saving there. Um, but even that aside, uh, actually, if we I, to, yeah, like go to on. Speak to that because um, that's a really important point. And this, the war on terror, is an interesting um, example because it's an example of a blood feud 
that is between a state and a series of non-state actors around the world. Um, it's, it's a kind of asymmetric warfare, um, where, you know, the states that, um, the parties labeled terrorists are, are living in or coming from are not strong enough to directly engage in, you know, state to state warfare, um, with the United States. Um, and so what has happened is you've had entrepreneurial individuals in those countries take take the initiative to um, attack the state that they have blood feud with um, in ways that the state cannot easily predict or defend against um, because they're in fact not dealing with another state. Um, they're dealing with a, you know, a decentralized network of actors uh, around the world. Um, and so th that also um, calls into question, I think, particularly the, the system of international law, because, you know, th the United States doesn't have jurisdiction in these other countries. Um, so its court system um, is designed to resolve domestic disputes internally between debtors and creditors within its own own country. Um, what we've seen in the war on terror, though, is this attempt to, and not just the war on terror, the, the practice of, of empire in general, is to subject other countries to the domestic jurisdiction of the United States. So you have like, you know, the 9-11 the attackers being tried in a court in New York City. Um, well, they're, they're not U.S. citizens and they, they don't reside in the United States. Um, uh, let, let's say the, the regime of international sanctions that, that the United States um, imposes on other countries and on specific individuals in other countries. Many of those countries are, many of those individuals, they're not U.S. citizens, they don't do business in the United States, um, but they're being tried in courts in, say, Virginia um, for violations of sanctions. Um, because at some point, some transaction in their, their economic network um, touched the SWIFT uh, based financial system, which is, you know, a sort of this extension of U.S. jurisdiction globally. Um, and so you're absolutely right. There is an international component to blood feud that exceeds the state and shows the cracks, the vulnerabilities and the limitations of the state as a purveyor of rule of law, um, let, to not even say justice. Right. Um, and I think the other thing that's interesting from a Bitcoiner perspective, now you spoke about this idea of institutions, right? So I guess if you could just first define how you're thinking of institutions, and then we could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So uh, an institution is just a, a, a social technology for coordinating action. Um, so, you know, human beings have to cooperate to do things um, and they evolve these institutions, um, some explicitly, many, many just implicitly, um, uh, bottom up, um, to increase the costs of defection. So if you can tell something's an institution because it's expensive to leave, um, and to, uh, decrease the costs or increase the rewards of cooperation. So there are incentives to stay within the fold. So whenever you encounter that structure uh, as a human being, you're dealing with an institution. Back to the show in a moment. Mempool.space is the leading Bitcoin and blockchain visualizer. So you can go to mempool.space and you can see the blocks visualized. And this is also really useful for targeting the fee for our Bitcoin transactions. You can see the high, medium or low priority. And this allows you to target the fee on your transaction accordingly in terms of how quickly you want that transaction to be confirmed. I use it all the time. It's a great way to just keep track of how things are going. Now, they have multiple views on the side as well. They have the mining pool dashboard. There is a lightning network explorer, and they even have a mempool goggles tool. So this mempool goggles tool allows you to look into the different types of transactions, 
whether these are inscription transactions or multi-sig transactions or something else, you can look into that and really get some insight into it. And of course, mempool.space also allows you to view the historical record of transactions. You can search transactions on mempool.space. Now, keep an eye out. They've got a mempool accelerator program, which is coming out. So if you are interested in that, go and get on the wait list for that. The website is mempool.space slash accelerator. And now back to the show. Right. And so, yeah, as you said, it can be informal. It can be a formal thing. Uh, When it comes to social technologies, things like money, there's also this element of competition. Yeah. Because, you know, you've got the US dollar system, but you've also got the Bitcoin system. And these systems are, in some sense, competing with each other. That over time, uh, you know, I think as more people start to adopt Bitcoin, doesn't that create an interesting competing institution dynamic? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, institutions compete. Um, institutions can be rendered obsolete. Um, they can they can be uh, they can cease to exist. New kinds of institutions can arise. Absolutely. Yeah. And so then I guess one other thing to tie back to, and you mentioned this idea as well, that you're not going to trade for some particular good unless you think it's going to be a long-lived institution, that there's some durability, right? right? So if, it, you know, if somebody's giving you a gold necklace instead of you know, some lesser quality metal, you're more likely to take the gold one because you think that's, that's going to be more durable. So I wonder then how much is it a matter of time for Bitcoin, right? That Bitcoin has been around now for 15 years, that people in their mind feel that it's been around for long enough that they can start to trust this system. Yeah. Um, well, if, if you zoom out, you know, and look at the um, trajectory of Bitcoin adoption from its introduction in 2008-9, um, it's the fastest appreciating asset in human history. Um, in terms of value, like uh, value in terms of, of, let's say, denominated in in other currencies. So, you know, even though from our point of view, living through the monetization of Bitcoin, it can often seem painfully slow. On a macro historical perspective, Bitcoin adoption is actually happening extraordinarily fast. Um, And, you know, People understand what it is like human beings have lived in ecosystems with different forms of money as long as humanity has has existed. Um, So, you know, they use different monies for different purposes. And so I think a lot of the criticisms lobbed against Bitcoin that, you know, um, it's it's. it's not going to be useful as a day-to-day medium of exchange, for example, are perfectly fine. It doesn't have to be. Um, it, it is a form of pristine collateral that is a store of value um, with significant technological advantages over gold, which is its closest analog. Um And it could be used as a medium of exchange in extremely low trust or high stakes transactions. And so, you know, the the types of transactions that Bitcoin is most likely to be used as a medium exchange of exchange for are are like um, transactions between states who don't want to use the U.S. dollar, uh, for example. So, you know, when you read like a lot of the chartalist literature on money, um, the, the exception that they always make to um, chartalist money is interstate trade or international trade. Why? Because if money is cr- a creature of law, then it's also a creature of jurisdiction. And, you know, unless you're a one world government, you don't have jurisdiction over every country. And so when you trade internationally, by definition, you're trading in units of account that um, have to be commensurate based on market principles. And those tend to be um, high value commodities. So 
gold, silver, um, and, and other high value commodities. And, you know, going back to, you know, our discussion earlier about, um, different forms of, of settling debt, um, like in, in ancient Mesopotamia, for example, um, there were really two categories of debt. There was debt that was denominated in barley and debt that was denominated in silver. Um, and the debt that was denominated in silver was, you know, the kind of debt that the wealthy, um, either the state or the, the creditor classes used. Everybody else, all the peasants, you know, their debt was denominated in barley. Um, and so the practice of like jubilee, of forgiveness of debts, it was only for barley denominated debts. It was not for the silver denominated debts because the people at that end of the socioeconomic spectrum, um, they had a different need for money. They were using money um, in a different way than, than the peasants were. Um, and you see the same thing in like, you know, the, the metalist monies of the early modern period, even into the 20th century where, um, you know, governments, governments basically had, your everyday medium of exchange money that was often, you know, worth very little with some, you know, copper uh, or like highly diluted form of silver or, or gold currency. And then you had, you know, sterling um, or, you know, uh, true gold. And that was used by international merchants and states to conduct trade across states and the value of the that money had to remain very stable um whereas you know the government felt free to devalue the kind of everyday currency used by most people um so again two types of monetary technologies right and in a way it's fascinating today because we have the choice so you can opt into bitcoin today early and you can use right. the high power money um today which is i guess the novel thing that maybe historically if, if we were just everyday you know quote-unquote plebs we might not have had access to the gold or right. the, the best level money which i think i would argue in bitcoin it is the best level money right um and it's interesting you make the point as well about how governments have this in their mind they think it's okay to just devalue and that's what we see in many parts of the world whether that's you know part much of latin america and zimbabwe where they sort of parts of latin america they just go through these devaluation cycles whether it's brazil whether it's argentina whether it's venezuela famously and they sort of now you're paying thirty thousand units to buy even a coffee or something yeah whereas you know those of us used to like a western context might be thinking oh the coffee is four dollars it's not forty thousand dollars yeah yeah no it, exactly i mean uh, devaluation serves it, it solves a problem for the state. Um, and, you know, if to some extent it can solve a problem for people, if there's a shortage of currency, for example, or, or a liquidity crunch, um, but it always, but devaluation solves that problem by creating another problem, which is devaluation of the unit of account. And so this is why these, monies that that fall into these devaluation cycles just have a limited lifespan like eventually they become worthless and so the you know the question is um often or the problem for central banks has been you know how can we keep the devaluation slow enough to where like most people don't really notice um and how long can we prolong you know the the life of this currency um because eventually it's going to have to be either re-denominated or a new form of currency is going to have to be introduced. Right. And one other area I was curious to get your thoughts on is around in this world with Bitcoin, and I guess this is sort of related to what some people are calling like the sovereign individual thesis, let's say, this idea that more and more people can use Bitcoin and maybe they can go overseas and there's sort of a jurisdiction competition aspect or maybe some people are just remaining where they are and they're just transacting with Bitcoin. But at the same time, you've got the state that's trying to tax these people. I'm curious if you have any reflections on, you know, like a red queen theory of money. It's almost that like people are adapt adapting mm -hmm. out, you know, to other forms of money because those forms of money are maybe less easy to surveil or to tax. Right. Absolutely. So um, the 20th century was an interesting time because it was it was the era 
in human history when the state had the most capacity to dominate money um, and not just dominate money, but dominate information, dominate trade, dominate war. Like um, I would suggest that the 20th century was kind of the apogee of state power. Um, it was, it was the era of high nationalism of high homogenization of culture within states. But with the advent of information technologies, the monopoly of the state on information, on commerce, on uh, warfare has been fundamentally undermined. And there's no putting that cat back in the bag. Um, and so what, what we're seeing is um, private challenges to the monopoly of central banks over money. Um, so whether it's Bitcoin or Tether um, or other, you know, experiments in, in privately issued currencies, we're getting back to an era that existed uh, everywhere before the advent of central banking, which is that um, privately issued monies were common. Um, that didn't mean that state issued monies didn't exist. They still existed, but there was no way that the state could monopolize the use of money within even its own jurisdiction um, because it it was one actor among many. Um, and so that's that's the world I think we're heading back to is that it's not so much that central banks are going away. It's that the central bank is a political institution. Um, it it serves some people better than it serves others. And so the people that it doesn't serve are going to find or create forms of money that do serve their interests better. <laughs> right. I think we're, we're coming with, we're yeah, it's almost a return. It's like a, as uh, my friend VJ boy party likes to say, we're living in this fiat interregnum. Yeah. And so the, I, you know, like you said, I think these central banks will continue to exist for some time, but their power is going to wane uh, comparatively, and that will be really interesting for people who are more interested in liberty, let's say. Yeah. Um, one other area I wanted to touch on with you, we're sort of jumping a little bit, but there's been a recent move in the EU moving against open source development. I know you commented on this recently, so I wanted to get you to elaborate on some of your thoughts there what's going on here and what's the threat for liberty and you know for open source yeah so you know the the european union um is is in a tough position right now it's in in recession it has been for a while um it you know policymakers in the eu recognize they're they're losing the economic competition um, both to the U.S. and China. Um, and so there's, there's a political debate happening about how to rectify this issue. Um, and for some policymakers in the EU, they see the answer as um, small and medium enterprises that are building and shipping software. Like that this is, this is where innovation is going to come from and, and policy should support these businesses, um, which again, great intentions, nothing wrong with that. The problem is that they've taken a look at the software stack and recognize that, oh, you know, 90, 95% of the software stack of many of these SMEs in Europe is open source. Um, so, you know, but, you know, we, we want these businesses to be able to demonstrate compliance with a whole set of new cybersecurity regulations that we're rolling out. Um, and we recognize that, you know, there's a, there's a high cost to compliance that can be, you know, anywhere, anywhere up to, you know, 25% of the total like operating um, budget of many of these firms. So how can we lower the cost of compliance for small and medium enterprises so that it's not just the big dogs who are able to comply with these laws? Well, what if we required all the open source code to comply with these cybersecurity regulations? 
Um, so that's, that's the law that's been proposed. Um, and of course, yeah. you know, it's, it's undoable. Like you, you can't, um, somehow corral and demand, um, every volunteer of every open source project to be, you know, certified, a certified developer by, by the EU and, you know, to then regularly submit open source code bases for security review and certification. These are volunteers. I mean, it's a complete joke, it's, right? <laughs> it's, it's just impossible. And, from, and so they're going to actually, and from what I'm understanding. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And from what I'm understanding, they are going to impose some kind of legal liability mm -hmm. for security defects found in applications that have some underlying open source code. Right. So the scenario could be, you could be some, you know, open source developer in the EU, just, you know, in your volunteer time, you're just contributing on some open source project. That open source project gets called or touched by some company's code. And now you can get pulled into a lawsuit. Yeah. That sounds ridiculous. No, it, it, it absolutely is. And there are some, um, you know, people in the EU saying, no, 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 that's not the case. It's not, that's not what's going to happen. Um, the problem is, it's, is it's very similar to like some of the legislation that's been proposed by Senator Warren and others in the United States around like reporting requirements for, um, cryptocurrency, uh, transactions, um, is, you know, the definition is expansive enough to include minors, you know, to, uh, M I N E R S, um, to include, you know, people who have no way of, complying with with these reporting requirements and so no matter how well intentioned it is what it's what it's doing is creating enough regulatory fud and like literally fear uncertainty and doubt on the part of contributors to open source um or industry that relies on open source to where these people are just going to start looking for alternate uh, alternative jurisdictions to do business in because they don't they don't want to be caught in the dragnet even if it's not the intention of the law they see enough ambiguity in it that they're like oh that's a huge risk i need to get out of here right and even in a case of ambiguity you could be worried that you may be politically targeted right, right. because now they can sort of just get out go after anybody but right. the broader point really is that i think the eu is just shooting themselves in the foot, as you were saying earlier, that their intent may have been to try and lower the cost of compliance, but this is going to massively raise the cost of compliance <laughs> yeah. uh, and to a level that people are just not willing to pay. And so they'll like probably the net result is there'll be just less open source developers in the EU. And what we'll see is probably EU developers who are really focused on open source will just leave. Yeah. And so... That is also going to create a you know a broader problem for the EU with it with an aging population and low fertility and so on. Like it, it just uh, is going to make them very very uncompetitive, and you know maybe that comes back to competitive institutions, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so uh, fundamentally, it just looks like a very awkward situation there, and you know, maybe they will actually just have to take some pain, right? Like if they go through with this, if they've passed this law and it looks like it's going to go into effect, I believe early next year mm -hmm. or early this year, sorry, 2024. Yeah. So I think it was passed in December. Um, and so maybe people in the EU just have to live without certain applications, right? I think another example I heard is that apparently Signal, the application that people use for texting and stuff, is going to be moving out of the UK because of their laws about end-to-end -end encryption. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, no, it, absolutely. It's we're in an era now of full jurisdictional arbitrage. Um, the costs of leaving a particular jurisdiction have, in some ways, never been lower. We have, we have higher both physical mobility and mobility of information, digital mobility, than ever in human history. So why governments would be taking pains to increase the costs of doing business in their jurisdictions or, or of innovating in their jurisdictions is completely beyond me. Yeah. All right. Well, one other thing, let's talk about Texas Bitcoin Foundation. So I know you are a founding member. Tell us a little bit about this and what are you hoping to achieve there? Yeah. So um, I founded the Texas Bitcoin Foundation because 
I saw a gap in the Bitcoin ecosystem that, you know, there are a lot of um, policy oriented organizations, um, but often the questions that underpin policy recommendations also require a, a high level of scrutiny um, and and a rigorous approach. So, the, you know, the thinking behind like digital self-sovereignty, why it, if we make policy recommendations um, favoring digital self-sovereignty, the first question that many lawmakers will have and even many voters will have is why does this even matter? Um, and so it's that that 30,000 foot view of political theory and political economy that wasn't being developed. Um, and within the academy, which is kind of where I come from, um, there's a lot of skepticism and hostility toward Bitcoin. Um, and the the language that kind of the Bitcoin community is using doesn't translate to the language that many academics speak and vice versa. And so there's this huge gap. Um, so, so basically what I wanted to do is create a organization whose mandate was um, rigorous scholarship on the topic of Bitcoin and political economy to begin bridging the gap between the university uh, and, and policymakers and the Bitcoin community. Got it. I am curious, uh, is university as it is today a lost cause, right? Like, have they just been captured? I'm curious what you think. Yeah, I mean, universities, um, universities are um, often established institutions on a model of education that, um, you know, is, is frankly medieval. Uh, in many ways, it's still feudal um, structurally, and the the challenge with with institutions in general is that they are conservative. Institutions don't innovate. Um, institutions repeat and preserve. Um, they're characterized by risk aversion. Their their main objective is preservation of the institution. It's not innovation. Um, and and the motivation of individual actors within institutions is to um, maximize their position within the institution, even at the expense of the institution itself. And so th this set of incentive structures in the context of the university has created cultures of um, ideological conformity, of groupthink, of um, profound aversion to change. Um, that are inimical to the search for truth. Um, that said, you know, there are still departments within specific universities that, that are doing excellent research, um, and, and good work. And, and so I wouldn't say the university as such is a lost cause. Um, I think rather it is like many of our institutions of the state. Um, in this era of decline and kind of sclerosis that needs um, either a refounding or um, startup institutions that begin competing with these older institutional forms and eventually replace them because they're more competitive. Right, yeah, and I mean, the reason I asked that as well is because, as I'm sure you know, uh, the recent news with the Harvard president being um, basically removed from that position because of plagiarism and, you know, people are sort of, a lot of people are critical of universities because of how co high the cost is to go to yeah. university. And, uh, it's uh, you know, I think I saw uh, Rob Henderson was commenting that uh, the IQ, the average IQ of university attendance has come down a lot. So, I I you know, in other terms, it's almost like the signal that you got from having a university degree is almost gone because now it's just so many people are going to university so i guess that that's where i was coming from but at the same time like you said uh it's a time for universities to uh ship up or shape out mm -hmm. right they have to improve or they'll be uh disrupted somebody else will come in and say hey i'll do that same thing for i'll provide not just the education but maybe the credential and the signaling 
in some other cheaper way and maybe that's uh where the where the rubber meets the road right absolutely all right well uh, i think we'll finish up there but i'll make sure listeners check out the link so it's uh n smolensky on x.com satoshipapers.org and txbitcoinfoundation.org so listeners check out the links and natalie thank you for joining me thank you so much for having me